So Catherine, you're kind of a titan in the community, as we've talked about you, just what you know and what you've done with neurology, immunology, endocrinology, um, just everything is so incredible. But what I'm wondering is how did, how did you know that this was an interest of yours? How did you get started? Oh, uh, <laughs> there's a history. <laughs> there's a history related to IFM. Um, I met Jeff Bland before I decided to um, put the blinders on and go to medical school. He was encouraging me to go back to naturopathic school, which Dan huh? Lucaser always wants me to advertise that I dropped out of naturopathic school because I couldn't cut it. <laughs> um, but but the reality is, I met Jeff when he was presenting at a conference, and that's a story for a different time. The issue is when I, I then went on to uh, go to Mayo for training and then stayed on staff, I was an autonomic specialist, but also a pain specialist. And so I had dual assignment there. When I left Mayo, uh, one of my best friends said, well, why don't you go to this thing? It's called the Annual International Conference. Why don't you just go? And to be honest with you, it was so long ago. I don't remember. I think it was in Arizona the year I first went. But I reestablished a friendship relative to meeting Jeff Bland again. And of course, there are reasons yeah. that he remembered the meeting and you guys can bug him about that. Um, <laughs> but I, I basically then got bugged to, to go to AFMCP. Now, Jeff Bland yeah. was assigned to give the meeting presentation. And the entire time I was sitting in the back of the audience under, under my breath, you know, basically correcting him for things that I thought he said wrong related to <laughs> neurology. Dave Jones, David Jones walked up to me after this meeting and said, we want to talk to you. And that started the, would you please do the neurology section of that? So the getting interested in this, it, it dates to when I thought I wanted to go to naturopathic school. In those days, huh. um, the first two years were in Kansas and, uh, for um, reasons that were just, it was basic science. And it was a very uh, daunting thing. When I decided to go back to medical school, it was being dragged, kicking and screaming. And so mm -hmm. when I came out of that model, I, I um, at Mayo, yes, I was a pain specialist, but also people would you know, I was one of the people, there were two of us that were there way after hours and people would come sneaking in with bags of supplements or things that they wanted to talk about. And it became this almost desperate attempt to not let anybody know that I was talking about natural things with clients at the world famous Mayo Clinic. So mm -hmm. um, long story short, um, when I started teaching AFMCP, we gradually evolved into, okay, what's next? And David Jones approached me about doing um, the graduate part of um, AI, AFMCP. So yes, we have an annual international conference, but let's see if there's something that we can take people deeper and that mm -hmm. resulted in the neuroprotection module. And though I had a couple of people um, that were part of that, they were a very small part of it. It was, it was mostly me doing this to present it. And the, the whole goal of that actually was my interpretation of systems think, thinking relative to presenting something like, all right, you have a patient ultimately who has a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease you look at it and say, oh my word, it could, it could come from any one of a number of different processes, which to me are systems. And so that evolution was to present that in a way that you could teach people how to think about things without being anatomically constricted into systems, mm -hmm. which is what allopathic medicine has done. So it became looking at things as communication or looking at boundaries or looking at um, processes where you build something, where mm -hmm. it becomes something that you have to have a physical substrate that's healthy. And then as a neurologist, everything about neurology, quite frankly, is about energetic communication. And so I got very interested. And when I left Mayo, I had been uh, a, a block doc. I really, I did all kinds of interventions. I worked in the Department of Anesthesia, taught young people how to do blocks uh, for pain things. And so when I moved to Colorado, it was a sticker shock for me because though I did those procedures very well, I couldn't really cover them in malpractice because I wasn't an anesthesiologist. So yeah. I learned um, some things. I met Carol McMakin, learned about frequency specific microcurrent, but had already been doing acupuncture at Mayo and biophysics there just for a history. So those things linked combined and going forward with neuroprotection, we then led to doing individualized modules mm. for, um, you know, to be able to teach people the sort of second step and how to link everything. That was the number one thing was how to be able to give 
um, a process that anybody could come in with the experience that they came to the table with and be able to apply those principles of processes that connect things. And oh, by the way, um, systems medicine, you know, systems biology back in the day, people were sort of talking about it, but it wasn't as accepted as it is now. Everybody <laughs> claims, uh, claims ownership of systems biology now. So that, I, I'm sorry that that's a long-winded way towards it. I, um, I really enjoyed that part of the process, trying to figure out how to teach people or how to inspire thinking just from different perspectives. So it, putting a filter on and asking the question one way, then putting another filter on, asking the question, and then trying to meet yourself in the middle. So that I, ho I hope that that partially, partially answers your question. <laughs> I want to ask you about your Ayurvedic experience. Do you perceive it from the energetic standpoint of how things are described? The language that is used is very um, yes. pattern oriented. So is that part of how you approach that? Um, that specialty? Yes, that is. Yes. So I went back for nursing. I worked with um, homeless adults struggling with addiction, mental illness, um, and acute care for a long time. I worked in the hospitals for a long time. I, um, and then I just went back for nurse practitioner because I felt like I just needed to know more and I wanted to do more. And that's when I found functional medicine in one of my wow. mentors, Keisha Ewers in 2010. Um, I was working, I had known her from an Ayurvedic program in 2004, but in 2009, I started shadowing with her while I was in graduate school. And so she brought me actually to the Seattle um, AIC was, there was another one in 2010. Um, and so I, from then I was like, oh, this is Ayurveda in a modern vernacular. And so I just started the certification program and then finished in 2014. And what I found was that you're exact, I, I agree with you exactly. You're exactly right that Ayurveda looks at everything from an energetic perspective and lo and behold, so does neurology. So although I worked in primary care <laughs> for about six years, I have really found my footing in this neurology practice with Dr. Eileen Ruhoy. We're at the Center for Healing Neurology in Seattle. And Excellent. it is... It is, it is, it is so much energetics, boundaries, membranes, um, perception, you know, neurology really is the science of perception, processing, and behavior, cellular behavior, metabolic behavior, mito mitochondrial behavior, and what are the drives for that behavior? And so much of that is our perception. So do we perceive we're safe or not safe? Do we perceive we have enough or we need to save for a rainy day? Do we, are, are we perceiving we're too hot or too cold? And so our, and, and Ayurveda talks about the indriyani, the sense organs yes. and how they need to be clear in order for us to be healthy. We need to see reality as it is. So and reality as it is, is there's the emotional reality as it is, there's the physical reality, there's the metabolic reality. And so pulling away those veils and trying to see things as they are, which is exactly what you're talking about with measuring energetics, that is really, that, that is the way medicine is headed. That's, and, and, and that brings it full circle back to Ayurveda from 10,000 years ago. Yes. And, and any traditional, any traditional system, if you look deeply mm -hmm. enough with perhaps the exception early on, um, met, you know, early on physicians actually used energy. One of the, one of my early experiences at Mayo was knowing that there was equipment in the basement that they used in the twenties and thirties in the OR with electricity that they were doing all of these treatments oh, wow. and things. Yeah. And oh, so wow. that, that first inspired, oh, there's more to this, even though, oh yeah, that's old analog electrical stuff. And, yeah. but there's yeah. a, there's a rationale for analog electrical stuff in certain ways. This issue about the signaling things in that context, I think that anytime you look back at any kind of traditional healing practice, and that's, well, that's trait language, but when you look back at it, you will see that it was oriented on how the energetic systems uh, were tied and related to the anatomical systems. So we've just taken mm -hmm. this, oh, I don't know, 50 to 100 year side look to say, oh yes, we're anatomically something that is related to a process. Oops, all of those systems <laughs> that we consider subspecialties are actually, each one of them has the processes and the ability to sense how it changes your perception. That's yeah. like, to me, that's the frontier of things. And I know that that will ever evolve. The other side of that question is understanding that one of the most important things, and this, I'm, I'm blaming it on your generation. I'm not blaming it on you. <laughs> We're basically going that we've adopted all of these things to allow energetic things into our environment without always asking, is this actually safe for our perception or yeah. does it mess yeah. with it? And so that part of it is to guide ourselves through those things without 
abandoning the gift that that technology is, but also understanding that we need to know more about how to keep the substrate healthy. And in that context, Absolutely. yeah, that to me is Ayurvedic principles. Now, here's the other thing. This is this is the hardest thing for me. Um, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, old, old language. It always really irritated me that I didn't have six lifetimes so that I could be an expert <laughs> in Ayurvedic therapies, that I could be an expert uh -huh. in homeopathy, that I could be an expert in structural energetics. That, and so the list goes on. Those yeah. things. So it's dabbling in those things and then having the gift of seeing young people take those things on and take them to the next level. That's yeah. the most, that's the, that's the most fantastic part of this process. So I'm just delighted that you're working in a neurology clinic coming with that different perspective. Now tell me how you're received, how, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, as far as I can tell, you know, people keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> the practice is fairly full. So it's been, it's been good. It's been good. And I've really maintained my Ayurvedic education. So it's been, you know, I went to India with Dr. Lad in 2005 oh, and I've wow. maintained... Um, I do work workshops and, you know, week long workshops and specialty workshops ongoing throughout the years. And I've done some other trainings. And then um, last September, um, the Andrew Weil series just published an integrative neurology textbook. Yes. Um, yeah. And so that was co-edited by Eileen Bruhoy, the neurologist here, and she had me write a chapter on Ayurveda neurology. Excellent. But the thing is, is that there's things that Ayurveda hasn't really encountered. Like in the Ayurvedic world, the microbiome wasn't as specifically discussed because you couldn't really avoid it. You know, there wasn't refrigeration 10,000 years ago. So you kind of got what you got and things were in, done a certain way. Um, but a lot of our modern challenges were not necessarily visible at that time. And so IFM really... I feel like completed my education in terms of offering this modern, not only the modern vernacular, but the modern approach. And it really has pulled together a bunch of different new and very worthy tools um, to be able to bring this to the forefront. So in my, in my daily clinical, practice. Um, we do autonomic testing here. So I do the autonomic mm -hmm. testing. And in fact, yesterday we had a, I had a fascinating patient who, um, she really, she has hypermobility and dysautonomia and mast cell activation. So lots of yeah. things going on. Um, but when we did heart rate, deep breathing, she actually started out doing it with Ujjayi breath. So kind I, of closing yeah. her throat a little bit and her heart rate, deep breathing, um, the, her respiratory sinus arrhythmia, her RSA was, was normal. She, for her age, it should have been 12 or higher. She was 15. Yeah. Yep. And I said to her, you know, okay, for this next round, you know, go ahead and relax your throat. You don't need to do that. And lo and behold, her RSA dropped, dropped. to 12. Isn't that we, amazing? It isn't. It is uh, really, <laughs> it's fascinating. And so we did a couple she was like, and she's actually the head of the, um, well, I can't say who she is. Anyway, she's okay. part of a research foundation. And so she said, I got to know more. So then we repeated it a couple of times. And every time she did Ujjayi, the RSA returned to normal or near yeah. normal. Yeah. And every time she did open-throated breathing, it dropped. And I just thought, my God, we need to know more. These are things we need to know because Ujjayi breathing is something that you can access every time you take a breath. Right. And, so, and all of those things that have to do with autonomic functions in that context are learning the subtle practices that change without your knowledge that you're changing something, yes, changes yes. the ability for uh, for optimizing those responses. Yeah, that was the great, one of the greatest gifts for me was to be in the autonomic clinic with Philip Lowe, who basically was part of the team yeah. of people who invented those things. Yeah. And so yeah, I, yeah that, that part to me is just to it's see awesome. that go forward. But now I'm gonna, I'm, I need to go back to a different point because my my most exciting <laughs> things, one of the one of the fifty things that I'm most driven to explore, mm -hmm. is the energetics of the microbiome. Okay, we don't yes. have the ability to identify all of them, but yes. looking at how they communicate, are they communicating energetically way beyond what they're telling the vagus nerve about certain perhaps chemical or biochemical um, signaling? That's the part that excites me the most. And then the other side of that, because I'm just I'm asking you this out of selfishness, do you guys do any <laughs> photobiomodulation in your clinic? Are you doing anything? We are you doing anything with light? Um, we have started to look into that. Um, we have, we do a little bit, um, you know, we do, do some red light therapy, okay. um, but we don't do, I think that there's, I think that there's room for us to grow that direction. There is and some, I'm forever telling people to get outside. So that, you know, as well, as and that, and, therapies, just to yeah, get and lay that, on the earth. 
Exactly. And looking at the, even just so visual perception, it, uh, it's a, it, I um, look overseas for much of the information clinically on different colors, the, di the different aspects of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So the majority and most of the textbooks that have been written in this country have been all biased towards either visible right light in the right. 632 to 4 uh, spectrum and then near infrared, whether it's 750 or 850 or something else and where you're putting it. Um, I'm working with some technology now that's not out there for giant use yet that actually has variable frequencies with the ability to vary the frequency all the way through the spectrum down to mm -hmm. ultraviolet and things that are actually perceived by the environment. And the greatest gift of that is being able to look at real-time physiological responses in much Ooh. the same way you look at autonomic type things and ask the question, can I change this? So the classic, um, the classic protocol that has been slam dunk in almost anybody's hands has been to be able to turn on the sympathetic nervous system really quickly by stimulating with green light. And it can be done with other, uh, other things, but green light over 20 years of looking at these things seems to work the best. Yeah. You turn on the autonomic system. If you're with, I think the, uh, the oldest patient I've ever seen this in was in her sixties. But if you look at somebody who's young and you stimulate the styloid and the stellate, you literally dilate the pupil on that side, and then you'll see huh. the body warm up first, the ipsilateral side, then the contralateral side. And eff effectively, you've done a non-chemical, non-invasive sympathetic blockade, and then you can see how people react. Wow. It. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's amazing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So what does your clinical practice look like now? Well, it's, it's different because of COVID. I had to make a very difficult mm -hmm. decision. I'm in a small town. Mm -hmm. And when we mm -hmm. had travel restrictions, I was in the process of shifting towards a, a telehealth type of functional medicine. My functional medicine practice has been a lot of um, identifying patients who want to see me, but working with their local, trying to get them to see mm -hmm. a local uh, functional medicine practitioner and then guiding them through that. So they're not my primary person. And that was all based on, well, I have a license to practice medicine in the state of Colorado mm -hmm. and not, you know, and not elsewhere. So the, the, the pandemic circumstances changed that a little bit, only in the sense that mm -hmm. I was allowed to do telehealth type things. Now, the, the downside of that was over the course of the year, telehealth from Durango, even though we do have high-speed things, I live in a building that's 21 years old, and so having high-speed <laughs> things was not really the greatest gift um, the planet offered. This, uh -huh. The second part of it was I have had people, because I've lived here for 20 years, actually over 20 years, um, and I confess, it's I must be hypocrisy because I, I, I stay here <laughs> relative to <laughs> living at altitude. Oh, okay. But the, and sleep and hypoxia and all the other things that come along with it are just amplified here. And I believe mm -hmm. that anybody who lives in Santa Fe has the same experience that there's, there are issues with that. But the practice this year, I actually did slip back into, okay, I'm going to take care of these people that I've taken care of. They're all, they've all gone into or near their Medicare years. And so I actually have been doing a lot of just straight neurology, and then people will connect related to the functional aspect in that. So I went yeah. back to accepting Medicare for a while, which was not intended, but I just felt like there was a whole community of people that I'd taken care of as a small part of the practice in a panic stricken state because of the pandemic. And so yeah. in the last year, things have tra transitioned. I um, am still doing the clinical things, but it's very difficult if somebody can't travel here to mm -hmm. have bioenergetic therapies in my office, mm -hmm. even to participate in any kind of mm -hmm. IRB related study that we would do. And so it, I'm waiting to see what transitions now and trying to be mm. very proactive about getting information out about those things that seem to be incredibly um, helpful to balancing the autonomic response. And so mm -hmm. that part of it is a small sliver, but this past year has just been a weird one for me because it's, it's been, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a small town and I have a whole bunch of people who are in, who are in a panic stricken state related to, they, they, you know, they've lost their primary care provider. I can't be a primary care provider. And, um, I basically have the issue of trying to take care of people and still give them the guidance that they, as a, as a person who just doesn't have a strong income, you want to be able to give them access to information that's, that's going to be helpful, yeah. not detrimental. So that the last, the last year has been, I hope it's been an exception. And so the, but the, but the things that have come forward related to the bioenergetics, mm -hmm. I mean, if any, you know, the, it's, it's not to advertise any specific technology because all of them have a place, but you look back at that and say, oh, when I was, a when I first was at, um, 
basically before I went back into medicine, I met a practitioner and I've spoken about, I don't know, I don't think she's still on the planet, but I met a practitioner who did auricular therapy and mm. watched her basically watched her place a pellet, a silver pellet in a, in a child, uh, child's ear with cerebral palsy and watched the eyes come apart and be able to track. And so that inspired me. You look at it now and you go, well, there's 3D technology to be able to tell people where they could do acupuncture points. But again, there's this disconnect with, do I have to go back and become an expert acupuncturist and dive into that completely yes. versus I can glean some things. And is that cheating <laughs> to, to glean things that might be applied <laughs> to have a truly integrative practice with? But I, I come to the table still really firmly believing that I, the knowledge of my basic neurology, just the knowledge of the biochemistry, the knowledge of the physics, the knowledge of the energetics was the best thing that could have happened. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't mean I would counsel you or your child to go back and become a neurologist. No, I wouldn't mm -hmm. do that. But <laughs> being able to bring those things that have come out of very significant learning without just being, we're suppressing symptoms, we're controlling your symptoms. It needs yeah. to be reinvigorating both the biophysical structure, the yeah. the anatomical structure, the dynamics of things. And when you start going through what we traditionally called the systems, um, back in the dark ages, Bethany, uh, Bethany Hayes and I, and for those of you who don't, Bethany Hayes um, is also a gift to, the, to, <laughs> to functional <Yes>. medicine. <laughs> Bethany and I were at a retreat uh, in Mexico, basically at Sanaviv, and we were trying to convince, mostly men, but we were trying to convince people that systems <laughs> medicine was a really appropriate thing, and they just booed us off the stage. They you know, uh. literally took and I, I look back and I go, well, you know, hanging in there and plugging, things seem to have changed. So yeah, be, devo yeah. be, be devoted, wow. yeah, be devoted wow. and continue learning lifelong, most important thing, most important yeah. gift you can have. Yeah, yeah. When you start looking at how, so people normally think about, well, you want to keep the brain healthy. No, you actually want to keep the entire system of communication. And that's both, yeah. that's both some chemicals, but it's also energy. It's also signal patterns. It's also knowing yeah. that we now have the technology to look at acupuncture points within your body and know whether or not yeah. they're, they're, they are overactive or underactive in ways that Chinese medicine is you know, taught, taught uh, practitioners for years relative yeah. to that. But now Western yeah. medicine has the ability to go, is that active or not? Is it overactive yeah. or it is underactive? And in real time, how does it change? It's not just a snapshot, like a lab yeah. draw. Oh, what were you like during those 25 seconds of somebody pulling that blood out to measure something? So yes. I, th yeah. I think that those are the greatest gifts to go forward. The ability to look at systems through different lenses and be able to change the lenses. Um, and Honestly, Jeff Bland, I think it was Jeff Bland and I had this argument. Well, if you put on upside down glasses, how long does it take for somebody yeah. to flip the environment upside down? And if the time is shorter, does that mean the person has more vitality or, or the person does has less stability of their perception related to that? Yes. We still have any. I think maybe somebody has answered that question, <laughs> but we, and, uh, we, never, we never did answer that question. So the, that's the type of thing to look for relative yeah. to... Um, asking the perception. And that, that's what's the, the greatest gift is to know the tools that you're using today are going to be different tools, you know, even yeah. just in the coming months. And the gift yeah. is, the wisdom is actually to be open to not assuming that you know everything there is to know. And I, you, you obviously know that. I think anybody that I've met in IFM, that's part of the process. Now, the other thing, I have to make this, this intellectual mm -hmm. comment. Um, most of my generation of practitioners really still go, IFM, it's not virtual about the information. It's about the energy in the room with all of these people that you adore, but you might only see them once a year kind of yeah. thing. So ha knowing that this is the 30th year, I'm looking yes. forward to the 31st, if we can all be in the same place energetically yeah. sharing these things. So yes. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to have a virtual conversation with you, but boy, would I like to be in the same room <laughs> seeing what <laughs> you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I very much look forward to that and it will happen and it will be awesome.